When workers began demolishing a house, they exposed a historical secret hidden in the walls. The task at hand seems simple enough. A demolition crew has gathered to tear down an old house. As they slowly chip away at the abode, though, the group notices something strange about the property's white siding. And after taking a closer look, the wrecking crew realizes that this dwelling hides a historic secret. One that has lain concealed for centuries. The house in question stood in Prescott, Arkansas, a small city 100 miles outside of the state's capital, Little Rock. Fewer than 4,000 people lived in Prescott, as of the 2010 census. In the past, though, the city had been a well-known hotspot on the map of the United States because it sat on the Prairie Dane. This is a sprawling stretch of land first colonized by the French. In fact, Prescott was officially incorporated on October 6, 1874, making it a city on the state's register. But these lands have more stories to share than just that. Just ask the demolition crew sent to an unassuming old house in 2019. After all, the team's work uncovered a lot more of Prescott and the nation's history. Before Prescott existed, you see, French colonists claimed the encompassing area, Prairie Dane. The name translates to Donkey Meadow, and the place was just about as strange as its moniker. In the middle of an otherwise thick forest of pine trees, after all, its prairie land sprawled for 20 miles. And the Prairie Dane held an important geographical position when pro-slavery Arkansas seceded from the U.S. and joined the Confederate States of America. So, during that time, state leaders had to move their dealings from Union-held Little Rock to Washington, Arkansas, which became their makeshift capital. If you traveled west from Prairie Dane then, you'd reach Washington. Trekking east led to Camden, a well-protected city that served as a headquarters for many Confederate troops. And a journey to the south would end at the Red River, which proved a strategic passageway. Venturing even further in that direction would see people through to Shreveport and Dallas, among other southern strongholds. Once the Union Army took over Little Rock, then Prairie Dane became an important piece of land for the Confederacy. In fact, as southern soldiers fled their former capital, they began to build defensive works along the trail from there to Washington. It proved impossible for the Confederacy to construct adequate defense positions across all the prairie land, though because it was simply too large. Nonetheless, the Prairie Dane formed part of the territory between the Union and the Confederates' new capital in Washington. So, if the Union soldiers got through this location, they'd have a clear pathway to their foe's hub. The force's effort to do just that began with the Battle of Prairie Dane, which commenced on April 9, 1864. Just south of Prescott, Union and Confederate soldiers fought for four days over the 20-mile stretch of prairie land. The Union forces eventually won the Battle of Prairie Dane, and their leader, Frederick Steele, then decided to march his troops towards Camden. That's because his soldiers needed supplies, of which they found very little in the fortified city to the prairie's east. In the end, then, Steele took his troops back to their base at the captured city of Little Rock, but the journey there resulted in one of the bloodiest fights recorded during the Civil War, the Battle of Jenkins Ferry. And after skirmishes lasting two days, the Union forces again emerged victorious, eventually returning to their well-protected Arkansas seat. Just under a year later, the Confederacy's General Robert E. Lee would wave the white flag at the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse. This meant victory went to the Union's Ulysses S. Grant, in both the battle and the Civil War. That's because Confederate generals across the country followed their leader and surrendered too. Of course, with the end of the Civil War came a new era in the U.S. history, called Reconstruction. This is when all slaves went free and the country quite literally had to rebuild itself after years of conflict. Slowly but surely, though, the states banded together to build national unity as a single set of United States. Although not a major landmark in Reconstruction-era developments, Prescott, Arkansas did receive its official platting in 1873. This meant that the land was mapped or charted with all of its proposed features. 
In the case of the small city on the Prairie Dane, this meant penciling in a train station for the then-in-construction Cairo and Fulton Railroad. The railroad would help Preston grow into a bustling city. Its original layout featured a grid of 48 blocks split down the middle by the Cairo and Fulton tracks, and local merchants relied on this method of transport to move their products in and out of town, which helped businesses too. The Reconstruction era saw Prescott achieving several other important firsts. For instance, the city got its newspaper in 1875, two years after it cut the ribbon on the first post office. In the last year of Reconstruction, 1877, the county seat moved to Prescott, highlighting the metropolis's importance to the area. So Prescott became a governmental and legal hub in the wider Nevada county limits. Telephone lines and a water and light plant arrived at the turn of the 20th century. At the same time, timber became a big industry for the city as well as cotton and peaches. All of it traveled out of its town via train. But times change, and as previously mentioned, nowadays fewer than 4,000 people live in Prescott. The city covers 6.5 square miles, which gives the place a population density of about 565 people per square mile. But not every building in town is used anymore, and in 2019, a crew attempted to remove one such home from the landscape. The home in question sat on Prescott's Green Lawn Avenue, and it seemed simple enough from the outside. White siding covered its exterior, and the abode had a simple, rectangular shape. Its facade featured four windows and a front door, too. It likely seemed like a basic teardown to the crew in charge. As the crew started to deconstruct the Green Lawn Street home, however, they noticed something strange. The white siding on the home's exterior covered the bones of the dwelling, and this structure held a secret long forgotten. Indeed, the house contained a huge piece of local history. Specifically, peeling back the layers of the Prescott home revealed that it had been built around the structure of another, much older dwelling. It was a log cabin, in fact, one that measured only 18 by 20 feet and experts found its history may trace back to the start of Prescott itself. The Nevada County Depot and Museum subsequently looked into the uncovered cabin's lengthy history, and the researchers found that the structure hadn't always sat on Green Lawn Street. So between 1933 and 1955, someone had moved the structure to its final location. Along the way too, someone had changed the layout of the abode. The cabin itself measured in at less than 400 square feet, but the white house in which it sat was larger. The museum explained how the building's footprint had changed over time. In an October 2019 Facebook post, staff wrote, the cabin had been added onto and the exterior encapsulated with siding. Land ownership records revealed even more about the log cabin's past to the museum's experts. It seemed that the home originally stood on Prescott's Miller Hill, and documents showed that a man named John Vaughn owned the land between 1850 and 1860. This gave a good clue as to when the cabin was built. Even more interestingly, the location of Vaughn's land seemed to be near one of Prescott's most famous landmarks, the Prairie Dane Battlefield, where Union soldiers had defeated the Confederates in 1864. This meant that the cabin's inhabitants may have witnessed a major Civil War battle. The materials used to build the cabin seemed to support this estimation of its age, as resources changed when trains started arriving in the Reconstruction era. The museum's Facebook post explained, It is made of hand-hewn timbers and predates the coming of the railroad in the 1870s, which brought sawn lumber. The museum also made it clear that the historic cabin would end up in good hands. Staff shared via Facebook that a local donor had handed over enough funds for them to buy the cabin. That way, they could disassemble it and store it and one day rebuild it alongside the Prairie Dane battlefield, where it once stood. Moving the cabin hadn't proved particularly straightforward, though. Soon after the museum made its intentions clear, a debate arose about the cabin's ownership. So until the issue was resolved, the organization couldn't take over the structure, deconstruct it, or put it on display for the world to see. 
Eventually, though, the museum will have to follow quite a painstaking protocol to take the cabin down. One of the organization's board members made a call for volunteers on Facebook. He said that they would need a team because they would have to tear this down piece by piece, label it, store it, then later reassemble it. Until then, the local and online community who saw the news of the log cabin shared their joy over the discovery. Many people highlighted the addition of siding and how the home's previous owners had inadvertently preserved history by updating the exterior. One Facebook user wrote, It is in magnificent condition. Others pointed out interesting cabin details that the museum had missed in its initial roundup. For instance, a commenter noted, if you zoom in, you can see the square nails that were used. So much history hidden from the public's eyes. Most viewers gushed over the discovery of such a special landmark, too. One person wrote, Now this is news I love seeing, the history in our country. Another lauded the museum's efforts to protect the cabin, writing, Thank you for saving this building. It is a wonderful piece of history that will live on. As it turns out, though, it is not the only remnant of its kind to have been uncovered in similar circumstances. One person on Facebook reported that their abode had the same Civil War-era infrastructure. Namely, they said, their home had been built with the same type of timber. The commenter added, There is straw mixed with mud packed between the logs. The walls of this house are about 10 inches thick. Similar finds have also made the news just as the Prescott cabin did. In 2017, for instance, Kevin Kemp and Jennifer Alexander had big plans to rip down their Dublin, Ohio property so they could build a new one in its place. Before that big project, though, Kemp had began to pull wood paneling from the walls, and he noticed something. Kemp's friend Larry Daniels was there to help with the project. The homeowner shouted to Daniels as he peeled back layers of wood paneling. According to the local daily newspaper, the Columbus Dispatch, Kemp said, We pulled off one of the pieces of paneling and I said, Larry, that's a log. We pulled off another and I said, My God, this is a log cabin. Finding an age-old dwelling inside of his home was a surreal experience for Kemp, to say the least. He told Fox News, You're not ready to see a log cabin inside of a modern home. And it looks like, just over time, it was forgotten. But his demolition work revealed it, and experts went to work uncovering the secret cabin's history. Dublin Historical Society's Tom Holton shared what they found with the Columbus Dispatch. He said the cabin measured in at 30 feet by 25 feet, and it had remained untouched since its construction, which probably took place between 1820 and 1840. The earliest records relating to the cabin list its first known owner as the A. Matties, who lived there in 1856. In the wake of the discovery, Kemp and Alexander realized their construction project couldn't go forward as planned. Instead, they reached out to the city officials so that they could take and preserve the historical building. The couple didn't receive any money in exchange for their find, but they were nonetheless hopeful that the move could help defray the cost of their renovation plans.